So our speaker today is Sam Mugel. He's the founder and CTO of Multiverse Computing. Multiverse specializes in quantum algorithmic solutions for the financial industry, and they already collaborate with some of the leading financial institutions. And you'll hear a few of those stories today. Sam is an expert in quantum computing and quantum machine learning. He earned a PhD, a PhD jointly awarded by ICFO from Spain and the University of Southampton in the UK. He was formerly a computational physicist at Corterio in the UK, scientific advisor at the Quantum Revolution Fund, and founder and CTO at Ground State Consulting. Uh, joining Sam today will be Jen Houston, Senior Vice President of Global Marketing and Public Affairs at D-Wave. Uh, Jen joined us nearly three years ago and brings almost 20 years of marketing and communications experience in the technology and software industries. Before joining D-Wave, she was Vice President of Marketing at Aptio and a vital member of the senior leadership team who led the company to its IPO in September 2016. Uh, so again, um, thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to Sam, who will talk about the work that Multiverse has been doing in quantum computing for finance. Great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Susan. And uh, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, really really thrilled to, to be able to show this exciting work that we're doing so i'm the uh, cto of multiverse computing uh we're uh, one of the leading companies in implementing uh quantum algorithms for finance uh on quantum computers and really as you'll see um deriving commercial value from them today um so I'll present our company uh, rapidly, uh, tell you a little bit about the state of the field of quantum computing and finance. And then um, I've got some really exciting results to present that uh, we obtained in collaboration with some major European banks. And then we can get into the fun stuff at the end and get a little bit technical. Um, if you get lost in these last 10 minutes, don't worry about it. Uh, we have a Q&A session afterwards that's going to be very exciting so um yeah definitely don't log off uh great so this is our funding uh founding team so um we've been so enrique alfonso roman and i have been working together for about four years now and uh we founded multiverse almost two years ago and since then uh, we've grown massively, so we're distributed between part of our team is in Canada, so I'm in Toronto at the moment, and uh, part of our team is over in Spain. Uh, uh, practically everyone in our team is either like from a mathematics or physics background or extremely smart people. Um, they didn't all fit on one slide. And uh, we're actually in the process of hiring at the moment, so if you come from a technical background, if you're interested in applying quantum algorithms to finance, like definitely shoot me an email. Um, I forgot to mention my email is available on the first slide of this presentation. And don't hesitate to message me to ask for a copy of these slides and everything. Um, so these are some of the customers that uh, we're working with. Uh, BBVA is the top 47th bank in the world. Uh, Bankia is another major European bank, uh, the 100th bank in the world by size of investment. And the work that I'll be presenting today is very much the work that we developed in collaboration with these, with these major banks. We're also working with Hacienda, which is a European tax agency. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to tell you about the work that we're doing with them today, uh, but really happy to take any questions um, about that afterwards. Uh, here are some of our partners. Uh, so we're a Creative Destruction Lab alumni. You might have heard of them. They're an incubator uh, from here in Toronto, specifically for quantum computing startups. Um, we're also supported by a whole bunch of like Spanish institutions. And on the technical side, uh, you'll recognize some words here, obviously D-Wave, uh, but also Microsoft, Fujitsu, IBM, Amazon. And uh, we're also collaborating with startups like Ray Getty, Xanadu, and Pascal. Um, so this is a big part of our strategy, actually. We, we plan to be experts in uh, every available um, 
hardware out there and, and just really know what each hardware, what type of problems they're best for solving essentially. Um, we were recently featured in a Boston consulting group um, analysis. Uh, so they really put, they put us forward as one of the major companies like doing uh, disruptive work in uh, quantum computing for finance. So we were really excited about that. And uh, more recently, we were featured in The Economist as well. Um, so here, um, I'm listing a bunch of uh, applications, a bunch of verticals that quantum computing can be applied to in finance and applied to with an advantage. I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but you can see that they're broken up between capital markets. This is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, credit and risk, which is also like a field where there's incredibly interesting work being done. And fraud detection, which is another field that we're very, very active in. Um, now, why I'm not going to discuss all of these, um, me and my uh, partners uh, published a paper about two years ago um, where we systematically looked at every one of these applications and, uh, and discuss how quantum computing could, like which quantum algorithm out of the whole zoo of quantum algorithms could be applied to that vertical. Um, so I encourage you to read that paper. I've included a bunch of references at the end of this talk. And uh, so this is one of them. Uh, great. Uh, this slide is about some of the major players that are like active and doing very exciting work in quantum computing, specifically applied for finance. And you recognize some major names here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, I'll describe a couple. Uh, BMO and Scotia are two Canadian banks, and they're um, active studying trading products uh, with quantum computing. Goldman Sachs is doing option pricing, and VW is working on financial market prediction. So really exciting stuff. Um, great. So now, I'd like to jump into the thick of it and tell you about the work that uh, we did with BBVA. So this work is on uh, portfolio optimization. Um, the question that we were setting out to answer is given a level, a maximum level of risk that I'd like to take, that my investor would like to take, what is the investment trajectory in time that maximizes uh, the returns on investment? And uh, the solutions to this are given by uh, this, uh, given by minimizing this cost function over here. So the first term mu are the forecast returns of all my assets. Omega t are my holdings at time t. And the, this is the variable that I'm optimizing over. The second term is the covariance. It captures the risk of my portfolio. Um, and gamma, is an investor preference term. It um, captures the risk appetite of my investor. So this is the parameter that I'm going to tune to set the level of risk that my investor wants to take. And finally, this third term are the transaction costs. So this is the cost of a buying or selling operation. And it's this term makes uh, this problem incredibly difficult to solve. Uh, essentially, the, my optimal portfolio today is going to be highly dependent on my investment history up until now. Um, and so our intuition was, well, maybe quantum computing in particular, D-Wave can be uh, disruptive, well, can help us solve uh, this problem much more efficiently. Uh, we also imposed a couple of constraints that I'm not going to go into very much. A uh, diversification constraint, which says that I don't want to invest everything in a single asset at any time. And a uh, constraint telling me that I want to invest all my available resources. And these were, these were implemented in a very standard way by penalizing um, investment trajectories that do not respect these uh, these constraints. 
so these are the results uh, uh, we obtained in collaboration with BBVA. Um, so as you can see, we examined six uh, different algorithms. Amongst these uh, is a VQE algorithm, which is a like popular uh, hybrid quantum algorithm. We also had a Gecko solver, which is a standard Python library, which we run on supercomputers. And then uh, the last two over here are the D-Wave hybrid algorithms and tensor networks algorithms. Um, a word about tensor networks. So these were developed uh, to solve very, very difficult uh, quantum physics problems. And one of my co-founders, Roman Norris, is actually a leading expert in this field. Um, and we're uh, now these algorithms have started to be applied to industry recently with uh, Google applying them to machine learning applications. To my knowledge, we're the first people to start applying these tensor networks algorithms to finance. Um, now, this first table, which is confusingly named table two, sorry about that. Uh, this first table has uh, these numbers are what's called the sharp ratio. This is the ratio of my portfolio's return on investment relative to the portfolio's risk. And a sharp ratio of around eight is considered to be extremely good. It's considered to be a virtually risk-free investment. Um, now we were extremely excited uh, to be able to solve, um, to be able to obtain uh, sharp ratios that were well above uh, 12 uh, using our methods. And what you can see is the, the largest data set that we um, considered, this XXL data set, this was four years of data and, uh, and considering eight assets, like diversifying a portfolio of eight assets over four years with transactions every month. This is a phenomenal amount of data. There were uh, 10 to the 382 uh, possible uh, portfolios. This is a gigantic space to optimize. It's many times larger than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So really quite impossible to, to tackle with standard means, basically. And uh, we were able to find the optimal portfolios in this case uh, using D-Wave hybrid algorithms and uh, using tensor networks. Uh, so the Python standard uh, algorithms were just not able to solve this um, because there were too many variables. Uh, as you can see, the tense networks found a, a solution which is slightly closer to optimal than our D-Wave hybrid uh, algorithms. However, uh, I'd like to show you this down here. So this was the runtime of each different algorithm. And you can see the where it took uh, D-Wave 171 seconds to run this algorithm. It took our tensor networks uh, more than a day to, uh, uh, to obtain solutions on this same data set. Uh, so that immediately led to, to the question, like if we have this uh, very exciting tool to uh, produce for very, very cheap, like close to optimal portfolios, like in very little time, like is there something that we can do with all these great portfolios afterwards, you know? And so this is what I'd like to call our first, like really commercially valuable application of uh, quantum computing to, to capital markets that we were able to obtain. Uh, the, the reference to the article is down here. It's still in preprint. And the reason for that is that this is very recent work. Um, now I'm going to get a little bit technical and tell you about how we were actually to fit, able to fit this gigantic problem on uh, the D-Wave GPU at the time, which was 2000 uh, qubits. Um, and the key to that was clustering. Um, essentially, uh, our intuition was you want to diversify a portfolio to minimize the risk. Uh, however, if two assets are very, very correlated, you're not uh, limiting the risk by investing in both these assets. So we measured 
uh, how close the trends were of different time series, and then simply discarded time series that were, that were too close. So here's the data that we obtained, and you can see that we were able to uh, identify assets that move in very strongly correlated ways. Uh, the way the, at the end of the day, we picked eight as the optimal number of assets to, um, to optimize. And uh, we chose this from what's called an elbow co curve. So we simply uh, plotted the mean cluster variance against the number of clusters. And we saw this uh, exponential drop off. And we said that the elbow of this curve is around um, eight, eight clusters, essentially. Uh, there's more elaborate ways of doing this, uh, like, for instance, using silhouette diagrams. What I'd like to say is that this method is not only useful uh, when you're trying to solve a problem on a relatively small processing unit. Uh, what we're actually doing here is limiting the space of solutions that we want to explore um, by doing some amount of pre-processing. And, and this really allows algorithms, even tensor networks, for instance, to zero in on the interesting solutions. So we also use uh, these tricks for tensor networks. Uh, great. Now I'd like to jump on a uh, project that's a, a more recent project that we did in collaboration with Bankia. And this was very much building on the work that we obtained with BBVA. So we're still looking for at a given level of risk, what's the portfolio that maximizes my returns on investment? However, in this case, our client Bankia said, we're not actually interested in uh, the transaction costs. What we are interested in is adding a new constraint called the minimum holding period. And this constraint is going to uh, be complicated in the same way as the transaction costs was. That where any asset that I buy today, I need to hold for at least seven days. And this is a very typical uh, constraint. The, uh, financial institutions were, were imposed. And to my knowledge, we're the, we're the first people to be able to uh, optimize a portfolio, adding this phase standard constraints in. And now this is the figure that I really, really wanted to show you. This, so uh, we presented this figure in this reference that's down here. Again, an article in preprint when in the process of uh, publishing this at the moment. Now, uh, these blue dots over here are random portfolios. I simply sampled the space of all available investment trajectories um, that uh, were consistent with the constraints that uh, we imposed. I should say the, the data set that we're studying here is one year of data, so from June 2019 to June 2020 uh, for seven assets. And we're looking at daily transactions. So this is a phenomenal amount of data. There's, there's 10 to the 1,300 uh, possible uh, investment trajectories in this case. And you can see that they're all, they all tend to be located between this like minus 20% and 20% return on investment and between like 10% risk and 12% risk. And our algorithms, you can see uh, we were able to obtain trajectories that are much closer to uh, what's called the efficient frontier, if you're, if you're familiar with that term. Um, so, and we were able to build these different risk packages. We tell bank here, okay, if you're interested in a 5% risk package or a 10% risk package or, or a 15% risk package, here's how you should invest. And once again, this is a problem that's really quite impossible to tackle with classical computing. And so here's the type of result that we'd provide banking. We tell them, okay, our 15% risk package um, portfolio, for instance, uh, provides a 60% return on investment. And to, to invest in this trajectory, on the 1st of June, 2019, uh, you'd have to invest in one fifth Fidelity Global, one fifth Amundi, uh, two fifths Nordia One, and one fifth Franklin India. 
Um, and we were very, very proud to be able to present these results to, to a, a banker. Um, over this time period, they had been able to obtain a 20%, uh, slightly above a 20% return on investment. And this was a really good result for them. So we were very proud to, to be able to, to provide a portfolio that, that promised such a larger return on investment. And as you can see, well, it's a little bit hard to see this from the eye alone, but any asset that's bought at any one time is held for at least seven days, um, which is why you tend to have these large, rather large bands. Um, now uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we actually implemented uh, this, this constraint, the seven day holding constraint. Um, the trick to implementing it was in post-processing. Essentially, at any one time, I'd pick uh, what I thought was the optimal portfolio for that day, and then check with my investment trajectory, does this portfolio respect my minimum holding constraint? And if it did, then I would append it to my investment trajectory and then increment to a later time. Now, you might say, hold on a minute, there's a, you have a combinatorial uh, number of potential portfolios out there, and you're going to check all of these to see if, uh, if they fit your constraint. So yes and no. The interesting thing is that as I'm working through each uh, candidate portfolio, uh, Every time that I eliminate one bad portfolio, I'm actually also eliminating all the resulting trajectories. So while it is true that there's a combinatorial number of possible investment trajectories, um, I'm also eliminating a combinatorial number of trajectories with every step. Um, so great. To, um, to sum up, um, so our role as multiverse computing, we, we help financial institutions to, to explore uh, quantum computing capabilities and benefits uh, for their computing. We're uh, very much focused on providing short-term gains and, um, and, and profits today, essentially, to, uh, by, by applying quantum computing to finance. Uh, Part of what we do is to uh, uh, run algorithms on all different available backends. We're also very active in the quantum inspired and tensor network space. Um, in collaboration with Banker, we saw that uh, we were able to obtain a, uh, an investment portfolio that spanned four years of data. And I believe it was eight assets. So that's a little mistake here. And uh, we were able to do this uh, relying on D-Wave uh, quantum hybrid technology and uh, using tensor networks. And uh, I think these results are exciting because they really show a, um, a commercially valuable application of, of quantum computing today. Um, additionally, uh, we were also able to obtain over a one-year investment portfolio, 60% return on investment, I'll say 15% volatility. So this was the work that I uh, presented that we obtained in collaboration with Bankia. And uh, really the key to solving uh, these problems was our time series clustering algorithms and our post-processing algorithms. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you've in, enjoyed the talk. Uh, here are some um, references that you might find interesting uh, on our work with uh, Bank and BBVA, on our previous exploration of, of where quantum computing can be applied to finance, and, um, and on how like uh, tensor networks can be disrupted to industry. Um, you have my email address here. Don't hesitate to get in touch and request the slides or ask for any further details. And again, thank you very much. Great, thanks Sam very much uh, for your talk. We've had lots of questions coming in 
uh, many of which we're trying to answer and we'll continue to answer for the next 30 minutes. We'll ask some out live at the end. And if we don't get to your question, know that we have a list of them all and we will respond to them after the webinar is over. Um, so with that, I would like uh, Jen Houston to join us. Jen has some questions she would like to discuss with Sam. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Jen Houston here. Sam, thanks. That was just excellent. It's incredibly exciting to see uh, early commercial results using quantum computers. And I think uh, you and your team have done some really amazing work. I know before we were, were prepping for this webinar, we talked about not wanting to lose anyone because we went a little deep in the technology. What we're gonna do now is bring it up a level and then we'll go back to the questions to make sure that we are answering some of the specifics. Um, so let's start there. You know, one of the things I talk to people um, every day uh, about uh, how do they get started in quantum computing? And, and the first question that I get is how do you really identify right the, what the right types of problems are to be able to be utilizing the power of quantum. Sam, what advice can you give the group about that? Uh, great, well, thanks for the interesting question. It, it's, it is a very difficult uh, problem to identify I, um, use cases that are extremely interesting for, for quantum computing. Um, so actually to tell you a little bit about the history of multiverse, um, Roman and Alfonso and Enrique, so my co-founders and I, actually started out not as a company, but as a not-for-profit. Uh, one of my co-founders is really quite well uh, connected in Europe and had all these business people come to him and say, um, what is quantum computing good for? When's the right time to, to invest? And, and how wide should I be about it? And so the first thing we did was to set out to really systematically look at every uh, algorithm in quantum computing, there's a finite number, even though there's a lot, and, and look at where these can be applied in finance. And so we wrote a paper about this, it's um, quantum computing for finance overviews and pros prospects. And if you're interested in knowing about many of these uh, verticals systematically, like you can find a lot of them there. Um, but to, to answer your questions a bit more precisely, a, um, an interesting vertical for a quantum computing problems basically needs to um, gather four characteristics. Uh, the first one is a, quite a small input problem. The uh, QPUs, so quantum processing units, are still quite small in number of bits. And so you want your input question in a way to also be quite small. Uh, generally, problems that quantum computing can solve better than classical computings are like problems where there are many like possible solutions or states to explore. Uh, finally, you're interested in finding problems that are specifically very high value problems. Your uh, if the problem is not high value, you can't justify attacking it with quantum computing. And finally, the ideal, the best possible uh, problem that you can tackle with uh, quantum computing is one, the, if the industry, the best solution that we have at the moment is to solve it with a brute force algorithm. If you can find a problem that gathers all four of these solutions, uh, all four of these characteristics, then you're in business. Like you might have a really interesting application for quantum computing. Yeah, that's, I think that's a really great point. One of the things I like to tell people and they're always surprised is quantum computers are not good for every problem. It's really about identifying and focusing on those really NP hard areas. So thanks, that's, that's really good advice. I've never heard anyone say it in four steps. So thank you. Um, Okay, so the next question that I get always is, okay, okay, I figured out a use case that I think fits Sam's four criteria, <laughs> but now I, how do I translate that into a Cubo? Because this, obviously these problems have to be able to run on these quantum systems. Tell me a little bit about how you help, you know, as you, you shared a little bit of your thought process on the two examples, but how do you help people think about that translation? Right, um, so it's difficult. Um, so I'm going to answer this question specifically from the uh, optimization type of problem point of view, uh, which is the type of problems we tackled here. Essentially, uh, the f 
So in three steps, the, the first thing you're going to have to do is encode your objective variables. So the, uh, the thing you're optimizing to your qubits. Um, so in our case, uh, the first thing that the, uh, we did was to encode our asset holdings uh, values to the qubits. Um, then uh, you're going to tune the links, uh, so the interactions between qubits. And these will determine all the details of your problems. So for instance, in our case, we had the transaction costs and this would be reflected in an interaction between, mm -hmm. if I had one qubit that said, this is how much I have of asset one at time t, this is how much I have of asset uh, two at t plus one. And then to operate this transaction, the cost of that transaction would be captured in that interaction. Uh, the third tricky thing is when you're trying to apply constraints. Um, generally, the easiest way to apply these is through by introducing a penalty. You're going to penalize in your uh, objective function, in the function you're optimizing, you're going to penalize any states that do not uh, respect your constraints. So once again, in, in that case, well, in our case, for instance, we penalized investments that were unphysical, where uh, our investor was trying to invest more than his available resources. Okay. Wow, that's exciting. Um, I, I will say that you've made that sound, even though you said it's tough, it made, it made it sound super simple. And actually, I think that's one of the things that companies like Multiverse really help with is, is, is that translation. I think that's a key area. Um, and there's a lot of um, nuance and I know tips and tricks in, in being able to do that well. Um, Two more sort of high-level questions, and then we'll get to some of the specifics that we're hearing from the, from the audience. Um, so what are some trends that you're seeing in quantum computing and finance? So let's take it back out of, the, out of the math and into sort of the meta level. What are the things that you're seeing? You've been close to this for a while. Um, so one thing that I'm incredibly excited about is that uh, recently I've seen a, a, real, transi a real transition in, in published papers uh, from... Uh, toy model type uh, problems to real like commercial products. So yeah. I think we're really reaching that breaking point where quantum computing is, is becoming something the industry can derive value from. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is that there's been a renewed interest in quantum analog machines. Um, so things like D-Wave and, and there's other like incredibly exciting uh, hardware platforms out there. And uh, personally, I think this is very, very interesting. I've, I've always seen an incredible potential there. And I, I think that it's, it's very interesting that uh, people are starting to realize that potential. Um, so I think that both these points together um, like can be put together to, to really understand why there's so much interest from industry at the moment in, yeah. uh, in quantum computing. So one of the things that I, that I you know, ha sitting on the hardware and software side of things and the, the provider side of things, um, one of the things that we have heard from the market that really has helped with those two points is the introduction of hybrid solvers, the ability to bring classical plus quantum. I know that you ran these tests on D-Wave Hybrid. Would you, would you say that that is a, a true statement that the, the greater, the larger variables that we can help bring from a classical plus quantum perspective, the more we break that out? Is, the, is that part of the reason why you think you're seeing some of that? Absolutely. Yeah, I think this was a massive step forwards for the entire community. I think hybrid algorithms are really quite recent. I believe they were the first yeah. suggestions go back to 2016 or something. And this is, I mean, the, the idea is fantastic that you're going to use a classical computer that are incredibly good um, to solve, like you're going to use the classical system for its huge number of resources and then uh, just shoots off to the quantum computer um, these small, extremely difficult problems, all these bottleneck problems. So I think this is a, a real example of like where it's not only the development of the hardware platforms, but also the development of new algorithms that has really led to um, 
to increase the capabilities of, of quantum computing as whole. Well. Yeah, and, and we're hearing that as well. In fact, uh, in February last year, almost a year ago, we launched our first hybrid solvers at the time could only handle 10,000 variables. When we launched Advantage, it was now a million variables. And I think to your point about sort of choosing wisely which variables you're going to use, where the constraints are going to be, every time we can continue to grow that, that allows you to have less and less, as you said, move from toy and into, into something that's commercially viable. Um, so one more question before we take questions from the audience, because I know there are a lot of them. I think I see 58 on our QA. Um, I didn't know the team is madly trying to answer those. Um, what is the, so, so I always like to leave people with what should I go do? So what? So what advice do you have for listeners knowing people on this, uh, on this webinar, maybe first time that they've ever really thought about quantum computing and finance to people who have been, you know, are quants and have been thinking about this for a while, what kind of advice do you have and what would you have them go do? Uh, great. So I'm going to address specifically entrepreneurs uh, for, for this question. Um, I think the, the first thing that I'd like to say is, is find great uh, co-founders to help you in your venture. Um, so, and, and it's great to be able to assign responsibility early. Um, so when we started with Multiverse, all of us had uh, some significant uh, experience with uh, starting well with startups and, and with quantum computing. There was significant overlap between us. But uh, for me personally, to be able to know that I could trust my co-founders with all the public facing, all the, all the startup stuff, and just like completely focus on the tech, like this was a huge weight off my shoulders. And I, I believe this has helped us uh, to progress so fast to this point. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is uh, hire smarter than you. Uh, this was uh, my old boss that told me this and always stayed with me, is that if you did your job well as a founder, the founding team should end up being the dumbest people in the company. And, uh, and sure. this is really something that I live by today. Very true. That's great. Well, that's fabulous. Um, I think one other thing that I know I, we get a lot of questions about is how do I get started? So I just wanted to chat a second about that and then we're gonna open it up for the questions. So um, at least through the lens of D-Wave, we actually um, break the approach into four different um, steps. So the first thing that we do with when we work with customers, um, whether it be financial services or manufacturing or healthcare or pharma, um, the first thing that really happens is a, dis a discovery process. What are, to, to Sam's earlier point, what are those high value applications, the areas that would be discrete enough to be able to see the benefit from, from quantum computing. That's the first, it's sort of a discovery process. Uh, the second step is how do I take those and build them into a proof of concept? Does this work? Am I really seeing the return on investment of the investment of quantum, right? Just doing it for, for quantum sake is, is not gonna get you so far, especially as we're trying to look at commercially viable options and solutions. The third step really is taking that uh, proof of concept and moving it into pilot. Um, in our case, we've worked with um, three or four major you know, organizations that have, uh, whether they be a grocery, grocery uh, retailer looking at grocery optimization problems who are piloting in a number of their stores or financial services companies looking at portfolio optimization or even in some cases, healthcare and pharma that are looking at protein design. How do we get this from this intellectual concept into in like, like in pharma's case, a wet lab, or in financial services, an actual portfolio and looking at that optimization. And then last is really running in production applications. And I think one of the biggest questions I get is how far away is quantum computing? And to your point, um, Sam, you know, the annealing based systems are actually available to use today. And there's a lot that we can do on these. And so um, we hope that you get on the call, you get as excited about sort of what's possible as I think Sam and I are. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make one more comment about your entrepreneur concept. One of the things that I'm seeing in the market trend-wise is that there are a lot of people who are building businesses using quantum as a disruptive technique to break major, um, major uh, verticals. So I think you're doing some really interesting work and I think others, I've seen it as I mentioned in pharma, I've seen it in financial services and I've seen it in some supply chain manufacturing. So if you are an entrepreneur, think about how quantum can play a role in helping you uh, further that. So with that, 
Let's go to the questions. Susan, I'm going to hand it back over to you okay. um, and I'll let you direct who gets to answer those. Thank you. First, a few things. We've had so many uh, requests for both links to the papers as well as the slides. So we will be sending out an email to everyone who registered uh, with a link to this recording, with a link to the slides where you can download them and links to the papers that Sam referenced. So you should get that from us within the next day or so. Um, so again, we have far more questions that we can answer here, but we'll eventually get to all of them. Um, but let's start with some of the uh, questions that came in at the beginning. Uh, for you, Sam, are there international or industry standards governing how quantum technologies are allowed to be utilized in financial markets, like from the SEC? Um, I think that uh, to give a one line answer, I believe that not specific to quantum, uh, but obviously we're, we're held by the same standards as uh, any software, um, any software uh, for, uh, for finance um, applications. So for instance, we wouldn't be allowed to use quantum computing for things like market manipulation and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, how do you know that the portfolios are near optimal? Are optimal values for the data sets you used known in advance? Right. So this is a very good and very deep question, actually. Um, it's very difficult. So short answer, we don't know. Uh, the short answer, we know that they approach the optimal closer than any other algorithm that we've been able to run has. Um, we also have some metrics that are things like, okay, if I uh, invested in this portfolio, would I beat it? Uh, would I beat an investment in some kind of reference, uh, reference assets? So typically you'd look at uh, German bonds or or American bonds for, for something like this, right? And in our case, like, there is no investment in German bonds that will ever give you a 60% return on investment. So uh, we're able to say quite comfortably, like, even if, uh, I will always say close to optimal, um, it's very difficult to prove that you have the optimal portfolio. Um, however, I think I can comfortably say that we're, we're pretty damn close. Okay. If there were no technical limitations, how many assets would you consider? That's a great question. Um, I think the... So there's different things that you can do at this point. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I, I believe that we'd be typically like people are interested in, in optimizing portfolios in that range amongst a few assets that they've decided to be optimal. The, so one thing we could do would be uh, turn around and say, okay, if we were able to optimize a portfolio of say 200 assets, um, would you, what would be the optimal number of, of assets that we'd want to include in our portfolio? Um, the other thing that we could do is we have to make a decision at the beginning of the calculation of the our investment in one asset is encoded to how many uh, qubits. So, and this tells you something about the relative investment in asset one relative to asset two. And we could add a little bit uh, more granularity here. Um, so that would be my short answer. I'd like to defer actually to Sam Palmer, uh, who's with us on this call today. Would you have anything to add on that? Hi, sorry, could you repeat the question? I was answering all the questions on the camera. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so if we had unlimited resources, how many, how many assets would, you, would we be interested in, uh, in considering in our portfolio? 
I mean, that's really an open question. I mean, it's it's down to the asset managers of how many assets do you want to do you want to consider trading in your portfolio? I mean, yeah, if it's unlimited resources, you could essentially do all the assets in the world if you really wanted to, but I don't think anybody's uh, capable of trading that. So yeah, it really depends down to your institution and your group. Okay, well, Sam, why don't you stay on the line and so you can help us answer some of these others as well. How long did it take to calculate the portfolio? How much with and without calculation? Aside from the concrete timings, what was the theoretical complexity of the calculation? So that's kind right. of a mouthful, I don't know. Yeah, so let me start with the theoretical complexity. This problem is known to be NP-HUD. Uh, NP-HUD means that it is possible to demonstrate that there is no uh, classical algorithm, that you cannot tackle this efficiently through uh, standard means. So uh, very, very rapidly, you're going to have to be smarter than that if you want to tackle very large problems like we tackled. Um, as far as the real calculation time, so that these are actually the, the run times that I presented over here. Um, so in my bottom table down here, these are the actual run times for each data set. Um, and, or possibly with some very minor overhead in terms of like data preparations, things like this. I'd also like to say that the, um, so the XXL data set is more, is more than twice as big to the Excel data set. So you can see that there's a, um, we, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's very interesting like scaling in this case of the uh, D-Wave hybrid algorithm from the Excel to the XXL. It's even though the, um, we're scaling the data set by approximately 2.5, the runtime is linear in that scaling and, I think this is why I really wanted to put forward here. Okay. Have you also tried purely classical heuristics like QB solve or taboo solver to solve the problems that the hybrid solver performs so well on? Right, absolutely. So we um, tried uh, this gecko library. Uh, we have not tried uh, taboo solve. Uh, so that is actually in the works. So <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, no, we did try the Gecko solver. We also developed an exhaustive solver. The exhaustive solver has an absolutely atrocious scaling uh, really rapidly. I think already in the L data set, the estimates for how long it would take you to solve is many times longer than the age of the universe. Um, and the Gecko, the Gecko solver gave up around the Excel data set because there were just too many, too many variables for it to handle. Okay. And, and we're seeing even with simulated annealing that the numbers just, they can't, they can't keep up. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I, we, there's definitely a, I mean, there's a definite trend that the classical solvers are struggling with these problem types and that the hybrid solver definitely has a, a, a better approach. All right, did you impose any sort of integrality constraint in the portfolio, e.g. you can only hold an integer number of each asset? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And the motivation for that is twofold. So actually, we, the, uh, our variables are integer in two ways. Uh, first, as you said, you can only invest in bundles in assets, and this is very typical of like certain kinds of assets. I cannot remember the names of them right now, but I can look them up for you. Um, so you can only invest in assets in integer bundles. Additionally to that, you can only invest at specific times as well. So we're not considering time to be a continuum. We're considering, okay, you can only invest every day or you can only invest in BBVA's case every month. Um, and so this also contributed to making the classical problem extremely difficult to solve. Um, there's a lot more details about that. I refer you to 
to our paper, particularly the BBVA paper down there. There's a lot more details about that in this paper. Okay, I think we have time for about two more. So here's one. Have you considered traditional quantitative finance algorithms with quantum computing, e.g. percentage of volume, pegged, VWAP, TWAP, implementation shortfall, or looked into high frequency finance? Right, so high frequency finance, we decided early on that we were not going to go for. I think this has to do with really identifying what quantum computing is good for in this case. And while uh, quantum computing can allow us to solve these extremely complex problems uh, very, very well, a lot more efficiently and a lot faster and in their full complexity, um, Things like high frequency finance algorithms that are solved actually quite well by uh, classical algorithms, we don't believe that we'll be able to gain a speed up on that. Um, now, uh, concerning uh, all, the, all these other applications, I could tell you, I, I would have to kill you afterwards. <laughs> We're, uh, we, we do have a lot of really exciting stuff in the works at the moment, uh, but I'm, and not at liberty to disclose them just yet. Okay, uh, one more question here. In addition to transaction fees and hold times, oops, another question disappeared. Um, I think the question was, were there any other, sorry, this, this again, so many questions coming in at one time. It just keeps jumping around. Um, are there any other real world frictions modeled into the simulations, such as slippage, liquidity issues, execution delays, brokerage spreads, or taxes, for example? So, uh, no, no, we haven't gotten that far. We are looking at um, two things at the moment. Uh, one of them is uh, we're looking at applying different types of stress to the model, like things like how how resilient would our portfolio be if, um, if there was suddenly like a big perturbation to the market or things like this. And uh, the, the other thing that we're looking at is things like um, there's certain, so certain financial institutions are subject to uh, constraints from the, from the point of view of like world banks, things like Basel three and Basel four constraints. And, like we're looking at how to implement these as the constraints in our model. Okay, and the last question we'll take today is, can you clarify the post-processing in traversing the combinatorial tree and how it works with LEAP? Does this mean that there is one submission to a NEAL per time step? Yes, yeah, that's, that's exactly correct. So the, in this case, in the case of the Bankia algorithm, let me go back to that slide. We're actually, so we're, let's, let me look at this one. So in this case, LEAP is giving us our candidate portfolios uh, every single day. And then we're deciding, we're verifying classically whether or not these respect our constraints relative to investment trajectory to that point. And this is an operation that we can do classically very, very efficiently. Okay, wonderful. Well, again, just to reiterate, first I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Again, we'll send out an email with a link to the recording, a link to the slides, and a link to the papers that Sam referenced. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can send them to sales at dwavesys.com, um, and we will send them on to the right people to make it easy. Um, and also, Sam, if you want to repeat the uh, email address for Multiverse so that people can send you directly. There you go. Absolutely. So it's just contact.canada at multiversecomputing.com. Great. And let me just add, thank you to everyone. We appreciate you spending time with us. I've been asked a couple of times, can you do this via an API? Yes, you can go to LEAP. It's cloud.dwavesys.com and you can get a free minute of access plus a minute a month if you add your GitHub credentials. And for those of you who want to do real things like Sam, uh, we're happy to talk with you further, but it is all cloud access. So thanks so much and have a fabulous day. Take care. Thank you, Sam. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye. Goodbye.